Welcome to this video lecture as part of the assessment course. We will be looking at abuse and neglect reporting in this video lecture. And as with all video lectures, make sure that you have read the assigned course text before beginning to watch this video lecture. It will give you a grounding to what we're about to learn together. The course text describes assessment instruments that are used for, for example, interpersonal violence or abuse and neglect but does not fully describe the process involved in assessing and reporting child and adult abuse and neglect. And so I wanted to give you a firmer understanding of what is involved so that it, when you're in your practicum or your internship or your residency afterwards, you would have some idea of what your duties are and how to assess child and adult abuse and neglect. I will warn you that this video lecture is not going to be easy viewing or listening because of the content. Learning about abuse and neglect is not a particularly cheerful or easy topic to sit through. So uh, just know that ahead of time and the nice thing about video lectures is you can always pause and come back if you just need a break if it's a bit much. The sources used for this video lecture include Protecting the Abused and neg Neglected Child, a guide for recognizing and reporting child abuse and neglect. This is a free online PDF that is available uh, that is provided by the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services. So if you would like to learn more following this video training, you can look up that document and read that afterwards. This presentation focuses on both child and adult abuse and neglect, what is known as child protective services and adult protective services, what they offer, what your duties are. So we will look at both child and adult abuse and neglect as we go through this video presentation together. Let's begin with some legal definitions. So who can perpetrate abuse or neglect? What kinds of persons are capable of being perpetrators according to the legal definition. This is any adult with supervisory responsibilities of the child or adult victim or survivor. This includes parents and guardians, family members, child care providers, foster parents, and residential staff in a nursing home, group home, or treatment center. When looking at cases of adult abuse and neglect, it is most common to see residential staff as being the perpetrators, whereas working with children, it is not uh, as common to find residential staff. Usually it is parents and guardians, family members, child care providers, foster parents. So there is some distinction, although um, either any of those um, categories of persons could be potential perpetrators of abuse and neglect across the developmental span. Types of abuse we're going to be exploring. First, causes or threatens physical or psychological injury. So we'll be looking at both physical abuse and psychological abuse, and commits or allows to commit illegal sexual acts on child or adult, known as sexual abuse. We will also be exploring neglect, of course, these are the types of abuse that we'll be exploring. Three main categories, physical, psychological, sexual. We'll begin with physical. Physical abuse can be intentional or unintentional. Unintentional in that it may occur when the caregiver is frustrated or angry. They did not mean to perpetrate the abuse. Most frequently, this is unreasonably severe corporal punishment. So, for example, Spanking is one form of corporal punishment. A more severe form would be the use of a belt, for example, that can leave marks. That is unreasonably severe corporal punishment, whereas while we don't like to think of spanking as a psychologically sound practice, meaning it doesn't necessarily help children, it is not classified by most states as abuse. Intentional abuse includes things like burning, biting, cutting, twisting limbs, striking a child with a closed fist, striking a child under three years, interfering with the child's breathing, 
and threatening a child with a deadly weapon. You'll notice here there's a lot of references to children. A lot of this can also uh, be applied to adults if you're working in a residential home and you're striking someone with a closed fist or threatening them with a deadly weapon. That could also be construed as physical abuse of an adult. Some physical indicators of abuse include questionable bruises or welts. You want to be looking for physical signs in regards to physical abuse. We need some kind of evidence of that if a person is going to be held accountable. So these can be clustered injuries that form regular patterns with a shape of an article, for example an electric cord or a belt buckle, imprinted on the person. Injuries that appear after absence, so a person, for example, has not been attending school, has not been attending daycare, has not been attending, could be a scout camp, it could be, if they're uh, an adult, it could be not attending their adult day program, for example. So we would be looking for injuries after that period of an absence, because we would assume, if, in that case, if there is a case of physical abuse, that the person has been held back from attending because of their marks. Human bite marks and injuries at various stages of healing. Various stages of healing meaning the person has a series of injuries, not just a one-time event, and at various stages of healing suggests that there is some kind of a time span here that a person, again, isn't just having a one incident moment of uh, uh, developing a bruise, that there are several consecutive incidences of uh, strikings or, 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 or physical acts upon the person that have caused um, injuries over a prolonged period of time. Other physical indicators include questionable burns. These include things like cigarette burns, especially on soles, palms, back and buttocks. These things are rare to happen by accident. Burns patterned like an electric iron. Now, accidents can happen and a person can burn themselves on an iron by accident. Um, however, it's important to be aware of things like that because things like an iron can be applied to someone by someone else, if that makes sense. And therefore, are more likely to leave marks than by accident. And rope burns. We also want to be aware of questionable fractures. Questionable meaning, uh, as we'll get to in a moment, that a person is unlikely to develop these by accident alone. Questionable cuts, scrapes, scratches, or lacerations. Same thing, we're looking particularly for th uh, cuts or scrapes or scratches that are unlikely to happen by chance alone. Here are some behavioral indications feeling uncomfortable with physical contact. So this is the child or adult survivor feeling uncomfortable when they're around others or being touched, wincing at sudden movements, apprehensive when other people cry, polarities of aggression, then withdrawal. So either extremes of behaviors, being frightened of caretakers and being afraid to go home, complaining of soreness, moving uncomfortably, wearing clothing inappropriate to the weather to cover injuries. Hats are included here because sometimes a person can develop bruises on their head, for example. And they may be a chronic runaway. In terms of being apprehensive when others cry, the reason for this is sometimes parents will overreact when children cry. And so children who have been in those environments where physical abuse has been perpetrated by parents who feel overwhelmed, for example, when there's an emotional display, will tend to feel very apprehensive and even tell other children not to cry. Some caretaker characteristics include and these are characteristics, I should say that upfront, meaning they're not going to be apparent in every perpetrator of abuse. History of childhood abuse, substance abuse, uses harsh discipline that is inappropriate to the situation, offers illogical, unconvincing or contradictory accounts of the injury, stress within the home, relational stress, that could be marital relationship, that kind of close intimate relationship distress. 
could also be family distress, could be even friendship distress even. Employment issues, for example, unemployment or underemployment. Financial concerns or worries. Lack of knowledge about child development. So, for example, not understanding that some children just um, make mistakes or cry based on their developmental age. That's very normal for them to do that. Misperceiving a person. So seeing a child or an adult uh, survivor as bad or stupid or different or evil. Having a mental disorder, a personality disorder or psychosis. Failure to keep a person's medical or counseling appointments. This one is important. If you are seeing a client and you've noticed that they have been very sporadic in when the client comes to appointments, um, not that you need to jump straight away to hmm, are they being abused, but it's something that you want to consider in the context of other information. Unrealistic expectations of a person's ability. This again has to do with child development issues, but in addition to that, if you have, say, an a, adult who has a developmental disability, some of their care support staff may have unrealistic expectations of what they can achieve. Low frustration tolerance, impulsivity, lack of coping skills. This fits in with substance abuse, of course, because whenever a person is using substances, they typically have less of a threshold for tolerating their feelings without acting upon them, they're more impulsive in their actions, they have less inhibition. And isolation from support systems. This means that the caregiver doesn't have a lot of support and may feel very overwhelmed. So we've gone through physical abuse. We will be returning later on to talk about um, some of the specifics in regards to how you can tell whether something is physical abuse or not. Uh, how we can tell whether something is accidental or not. Or at least have some indication of that. Next we're going to look at sexual abuse, which includes sexual acts, rape, incest, sexual intercourse, as well as fondling and oral genital contact. We also need to be attentive to sexual explo exploitation, which includes indecent exposure, pornography, and prostitution. Whenever someone is in a caretaker capacity, they should not be involving people in pornography, prostitution, and decent exposure. And that is true for adults as well. Adults who have, for example, developmental disabilities, adults who are in a nursing home, should not be experiencing indecent exposure or be filmed against their will or their knowledge for the purpose of pornography. Sexual abuse can be a single event or over a prolonged period of time, meaning a person may have experienced that as a one-time event or it may have gone on for several years, several weeks, several months, varying. The perpetrator usually knows the person. Typically they are not a stranger in the cases of sexual abuse. Sexual assault is different, of course. This typically does not involve violence, though can sometimes. Shame makes coming forward uh, to report this extremely difficult. It can take years for a person who has experienced sexual abuse to come forward. And you'll often hear of these cases in the news where a person has been found to have committed um, sexual abuse of people under their care. This was a apparent in the fairly recent past in the Penn State case uh, in terms of their athletics program and inviting young children to train there. Uh, but what happened was once some of the cases started coming out, more and more adults would come forward and say, yes, this happened to me as well. And part of the reason why people stay in the shadows, if you will, is because of the shame associated with having experienced sexual abuse. It's not something that we like to talk about. The perpetrator also could threaten to harm the person or their loved ones if they come forward. And this threat can be taken very seriously if you are a child or if you are a vulnerable adult. And it can make um, 
coming forward very difficult because again a person is afraid of not only their own safety but the safety of others that they care about. There are some exceptions about sexual abuse that we need to go over before we start looking at um, a more in-depth understanding of what is involved with sexual abuse. Parents or guardians, a person as authorized by a parent or guardian or medical professionals may touch a child in their sexual or other intimate parts, genital areas, breasts, for example, for the purposes of caring for hygiene or medical issues. So if, uh, if a person is being bathed, for example, or if a person is being treated for a, uh, let's say, a problem in their genital area or their breast area by a physician, if that is not improper, if that's just typical regular hygiene or typical medical care, that does not constitute sexual abuse. Some physical indicators of sexual abuse include difficulty walking or sitting, torn, stained or bloody underclothing, pain, itching, bruises or bleeding in genital areas, sexually transmitted diseases, particularly in preteens, and becoming pregnant at a young age. Other behavioral indicators include a reluctance to change clothes, highly sexualized play that is not age appropriate. What we mean here by this is that you will find often young children engaging in sexually inappropriate play. Now again, you can't take this one uh, behavioral indication alone and say, oh, this child must have been sexually abused. I have worked with plenty of children who have sometimes witnessed their parents having sex without their parents knowing it, or other times they have had some kind of exposure to it and they have uh, uh, engaged in sexually acting out behaviors. For example, they've been humping uh, various toys in the toy area, or it is very common also for boys and girls at very young ages to masturbate publicly. That becomes more problematic when they, this, the child will do that even after being redirected or told not to do so. When it's more of a almost compulsive act, that's when we start to worry about sexual abuse. We also are concerned if there's an extreme fear of one particular gender, men or women, a sudden drop in school performance, sleep problems or nightmares, bizarre or unusual sexual behavior. Here we're looking for things like young girls who are uh, uh, stimulating themselves with objects. That is fairly unusual for young children to do that. Detailed knowledge of sex in young children. This is also, again, suggesting that the child has been exposed to something they should not have. Sometimes you will see children who unfortunately have uh, uh, been able to view pornography. Either the parent has some pornography that was not locked up or the parent plays pornography in front of the children, which is a, a would be considered po potential sexual abuse, um, just depending on the situation. But certainly young children will sometimes have more advanced knowledge than they should have. And if that is so, then we want to know more about that and assess more deeply there. We also look for sexual, uh, sorry, substance abuse and delinquent behavior, particularly in teenagers. Uh, this is a fairly common co-occurring condition with sexual abuse as well as suicide attempts, self-injury and eating disorders. Those kinds of behaviors can sometimes indicate a person is experiencing sexual abuse and I'll add from my clinical experience that when you see those behaviors clustering together so a person is abusing substances and self-injuring and has an eating disorder and has made suicide attempts and is delinquent at times if it clusters together strongly like that, we do wonder about, has there been sexual abuse? Caretaker characteristics. The person may be extremely protective or jealous of the child or adult. They may show favoritism. For example, gifts, money, attention or privileges that they do not provide to non-abused um, children or adults. 
They may behave in a secretive or isolated manner, meaning they come and go and people don't know quite where they are at all times, or there's something about their behavior that suggests they're being secretive. They don't, for example, fully disclose to their partner, their wife, their spouse, uh, where they have been for the past uh, several hours. They'll just leave and then come back and their partner will ask, where have you been? And there's no good response to that. The non-abusing caretaker is frequently absent from the home as well, often unknowingly permitting abuse to occur. This is often the case when you have spouses who are at work uh, when children are at home. So if they work an evening shift job, for example, um, can also occur uh, just over the summer months if one parent is watching over the child or another family member is watching over the child. So there are some supervision issues that um, if addressed early on, if the parent is aware of, can help to protect against sexual abuse from occurring. Though it's not always apparent to family members that a person is abusing. One of the more difficult clinical situations to work through as a clinician is when you know that a family member, say a mother, is aware that an older family member, like an uncle or a grandfather or a uh, even grandmother has a history of sexually abusing others in the family and yet let, yet they will still allow the child to spend un, unsupervised time with that person. It's a very difficult thing to sit with as therapists because we know that that parent is presumably unwittingly putting that child at risk. Marital or relational problems are also frequent, mostly because um, the person will be behaving in a strange manner, secretive and I or isolated manner. Often there is a correlate with domestic violence. So there's often marital relational problems that occur. In addition to that, one of the, the parent who is um, perpetrating sexual abuse can be fairly enmeshed with the child, meaning emotionally enmeshed, extremely protective or jealous to the extent that they side with that person, with the child, more than the other parent on issues such as when conflict arises in the family. Psychological abuse, also called emotional and mental abuse in the past, we now call it psychological abuse, includes patterns of verbal assaults, so screaming, intimidating, rejecting, ridiculing, blaming, sarcasm, ignoring or indifferent behavior, and constant family conflict. Constant family conflict here meaning that one member of the family is perpetually creating conflict within the family and uh, uh, causing high conflict scenarios, things like physical fights or things like high verbal fights, um, uh, uh, very frequent verbal fights that escalate very quickly that are dysfunctional. This can be a self-fulfilling prophecy if you tell a person, a survivor, that they are worthless enough times, they begin to live down to the expectations of others. We start to believe that about ourselves, sadly. So whenever you have cases of psychological abuse, it's really important to work closely at, with all abuse, but particularly psychological abuse, with the survivor around their cognitions, their uh, self-appraisals of themselves, because often a person will start believing certain things about themselves based on what others have told them. And that can be important for that person to work through to start reconsidering some of the more positive elements or aspects of themselves. This is uh, psychological abuse is more difficult to substantiate or prove compared to physical and sexual abuse or neglect for the reason that there's a lot of conflict that happens in families. Families have fights, families have verbal assaults. At what point does that become psychological abuse? That is something that uh, can be more difficult to assess, whereas physical abuse is fairly straightforward usually, although there are some gray areas as we'll come to see. Sexual abuse is fairly straightforward. There are some gray areas, things like watching pornography, for example. Neglect also tends to be a little more clean cut, but psychological abuse can just be difficult to substantiate. 
Here are some physical indicators of psychological abuse. The survivor will have somatic problems, things like stomach aches, headaches, nausea, unexpected weight fluctuations, what we would consider internalizing physiological issues. They may also have sleep problems, so there are some physiological issues here. They may also have behavioral indications such as age inappropriate behaviors, sucking thumb, rocking, banging head, biting themselves, it's what we would call regression. Some inhibited play, meaning if you provide a person with a play scenario, instead of moving to the first play object and starting to play around with the objects, instead the person is more likely to um, just remain still or to scan the environment because what the person has been trained to do, the survivor, is to avoid conflict at all costs and so they are less likely to take risks, less likely to even engage in things like play behavior which may enrage um, or cause conflict within the family. Polarized behaviors, we look here for overcompliance, passivity and withdrawal at one extreme, or aggression, defiance, and argumentative uh, kinds of behaviors. We also look for self-destructive behavior. Now this can include, again, suicide attempts, substance abuse, things like that. It can also include things like failing grades at school. It can include things like, uh, if you're an adult, um, not being able to hold down a job. So we look for those kinds of behaviors as well. Again, those are all indicative that a person has internalized negative things that have been told to them. Caretaker characteristics include a person who blames or belittles, so does not take responsibility for their own mistakes or actions, and will project onto others their own mistakes, and belittles, meaning talks down to, uh, in a way that is offensive, ignores or rejects, withholds affection, shows favoritism, is apathetic in their attitude toward a person, is unconcerned about their problems, has unrealistic demands, and has a history of domestic violence, is either the victim or the perpetrator of that. So we've talked about physical abuse, sexual abuse, and psychological abuse. Next we're going to talk about neglect. Neglect is a failure to provide for a person's physical survival needs. Neglect is often chronic in nature, uh, meaning that a person's needs aren't just not met during one specific episode of time. It tends to be a prolonged period in which a person's needs are not met. Neglect includes abandoning a child. This also includes vulnerable adults who need supervision. And inadequate supervision, bathing and hygiene, nutrition, medical dental care, clothing, shelter, and emotional support, which is, as we talked about with psychological abuse, harder to substantiate than some of the others. Some phys physical indicators of neglect include being consistently dirty, having severe body odor, lacking adequate clothing for the weather, unattended health needs. You may have someone who has significant dental issues like decay or major tooth pain. They may have abscesses that are untreated. They may have vision problems, like they really need glasses, for example. They may have hearing problems they need to be seen by an audiologist, perhaps they need a hearing aid. Also includes mental health needs that a person is not being brought to uh, mental health counseling appointments or they're not being seen by a psychiatrist if they uh, are taking medication. You will find this most commonly in people who are repeatedly hospitalized, by the way, instead of being seen in outpatient care practices. A lot of the time with neglect, a person will only be receiving what are called crisis services rather than um, more consistent outpatient kinds of services. Often the home can be extremely dirty. I'll explain what I mean by extremely dirty. 
my wife during one point in time was doing in-home work and went to a house in which the child was playing among a series of dog turds that were just on the carpet and had not been cleaned up. That would be an example of extremely dirty. Persistent hunger. The person just remains hungry. Often there is not food in the house or there is not adequate nutritional value to the foods that are being provided, meaning they may just be literally uh, some white bread available for them to eat. Other behavioral indicators for a person who is a survivor of neglect. One of the main ones we look for is attention seeking behavior. Often a person who has experienced neglect has been deprived of positive attention and they will seek this out through a number of usually dysfunctional ways because unfortunately if parents aren't giving a lot of positive attention the child will find a way to get that attention and it tends to be more negative and it will be things like acting out it may be um, destruction of property it may be attacking other people it may be using foul language it could be uh, not uh, pooping on the floor or uh, not uh, attending to their own hygiene needs. There's a variety of attention seeking behaviors that children and adults will demonstrate um, as a result of being neglected. Begging or stealing for food or money. There's a basic survival need for the person to find the resources so that they can just have enough to eat for the day. Extended stays at school. So being the first to arrive and the last to leave, for example. Feeling fatigue, falling asleep in class, feeling listless. Frequent school absences on the other polarized uh, side of the spectrum. This is because a, a child, for example, a young child, is not being adequately prepared for school or for transportation on the school bus, and so they'll miss a lot of school. And alcohol or drug use. Caretaker characteristics include history of abuse or neglect as a child, indifference to the survivor, the person being neglected, feeling apathetic or depressed. This is important to be aware of, particularly if the caregiver has recently given birth, because there sometimes can be a, 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 a syndrome, if you will, called postpartum depression that happens after birth when a person is a mother usually is unable to uh, care for the child just because of the hormone changes in their body cause a dramatic shift in mood a severe depression in which the person is unable to get out of bed unable to attend to anything um, other than uh, uh, just I don't know lying in bed really and so when you have uh, cases like that you want to intervene quickly because the person just needs some additional help. Um, the child can be neglected if, if that is not provided. I worked with a parent once who uh, uh, was not postpartum but was severely depressed, by the way, and depression can impact neglect because if a person is profoundly depressed they have much less ability to fully engage with the child. They're so in internally focused, just so beaten down. So you do want to help an adult with the depression if they are parenting a child and they are um, uh, just not able to engage with the child in any meaningful way. Substance abuse definitely is a big part of neglect. If you are a chronic meth user, for example, or heroin user, those drugs tend to knock you out for long periods when you hit a low. And when you're on a high, of course, you can do all kinds of dangerous impulsive things particularly on things like methamphetamine. And so you will find parents who will neglect their child, not necessarily intentionally, but just based on the way in which the drug affects their system. We also look for mental disorders and intellectual disabilities. If a parent has a significant intellectual disability, it can impair their ability to care for the child adequately. Chaotic home life. Hoarding food or other unsafe materials. Consistent failure to keep medical appointments. This would be considered more medical neglect. We'll be talking more about that in a little while. 
and leaving a child with a person convicted of sex offences with minors. I had mentioned this earlier. I want to expand that this is not just a family member. If a parent no knowingly leaves someone, like for example, it is not uncommon for a parent to be dating a boyfriend who has a history of being a sex offender and will leave their child with the boyfriend, that constitutes neglect. So you want to be aware of that if you have those kinds of issues with parents. Here are some examples of what would be considered unrealistic demands. We have mentioned this term a couple of times throughout the presentation, the video lecture so far. I want to go back and review what we mean by unrealistic demands. This is things like complaining as a parent or even as a caregiver for adult clients, excessively about table manners, defiance at bedtime, nighttime soiling, crying for no good reason. Remember, depending on the developmental level of the child or the adult, sometimes crying for no good reason is just a part of development. It's very normal. But the parent isn't able to understand that and so will have these unrealistic expectations and demands of the child that they will not cry for no good reason. Assigning adult activities to the child or even to adult clients who have disabilities, who have dementia, sometimes if we give them advanced activities that they are not able to accomplish, uh, that can constitute an unrealistic demand because the caregiver will become angry at the person if they cannot complete that activity. Inappropriate attributions. So a great example of this is when a parent of an infant says, he knows it makes me mad, but he does it anyway. Well, the point here is that infants aren't intentionally doing things to make the parent angry, but the parent is attributing that to the infant, that they're, that's their rationale, their motivation, uh, their intention of behind the behavior. Denying legitimate medical illnesses, injuries, and developmental delays. So when someone has a legitimate, for example, developmental delay as an adult, if the caregiver is unwilling to accept that and says, no, they're just faking it, or no, um, we, we need to treat them as someone who is capable of so much more than that, that can um, be dangerous because it sets up the person for a failure, really and excessive anger at the child's performance or conduct. So let's say that a child is out in public and misbehaves by they're eating, let's say they're at a restaurant and they don't finish all of their food or they drop something on the floor by accident or even worse, they spill ketchup on their shirt. The parent will scream and yell at the child for doing so and this is just excessive anger for the situation frustration is one thing excessive anger is another other questionable reporting situations that we're going to be exploring a little bit are corporal punishment unsupervised or latchkey children and failure to obtain medical care we're going to explore corporal punishment first so we're returning back to physical abuse and i said that we would explore whether or not something is abuse or an accident. So we're going to be looking at this and, and how do we tell? How do we know? So let's look at that first and then we'll move on to looking at more neglect uh, with unsupervised latchkey children and medical neglect, failure to obtain medical care. These are three questionable reporting situations that will come up fairly regularly and you need to be aware of whether or not you can report these. So in regards to corporal punishment, this is spanking, for example, for a child who has misbehaved, there is a fine line between abuse and discipline. In most states, it is legal for a parent to spank their child. By the way, it is not legal for uh, a non-parental figure to spank a child. Uh, so, for example, in a school setting, you cannot do that as a teacher or as a principal. So it does depend on who is doing that first. And then second, it depends on the severity of the spanking, if you will, the corporal punishment. At, w at some point there is a line by which if a person is overly harsh or overly forceful, it becomes abuse rather than discipline. I mentioned earlier that corporal punishment is not uh, thought of as psychologically sound, 
mostly because it's a it's not effective it is more reinforcing to adults than the child meaning if you're an adult who engages in spanking usually we feel if we do that we feel better about that even though we may feel guilty afterwards but we feel like we've done something now the child is going to listen to me uh, so the parent receives some reinforcement but the child doesn't receive reinforcement really at all that there's no impetus to not do that again in fact the child may become angry at the caregiver and uh, do something out of spite or retaliation is not uncommon for there to be some kind of a revenge action uh, from from the child rather than accepting the spanking and moving on so it can cause pr issues just in terms of how effective it is in addition to that uh, it can cause major problems with trust when you are f uh, physically spanking a child um, it it does erode to some degree the trust that you may have in the the chi in between the parent and the child or the caregiver and the child um, just because physical uh, striking does does not increase trust it does not help us to feel closer to others it does not feel like we can be soothed by others it feels like the other person is threatening is a danger to us this can easily become abuse that we talked about the fine line between abuse and discipline because of differentials in size and power and the use of force an adult is typically much much larger and more physically more powerful than the child and so a strike or a spank to the adult may seem fairly light but to the child that may seem fairly forceful depending on the child so again it's a gray area and something you probably if you're working with parents who spank want to be talking with parents about because there are more effective parenting strategies for dealing with problem behavior than spanking things like as you'll be learning about in a if you when you take your family ca counseling class things like natural and logical consequences it is not permitted as schools foster homes treatment centers as i would mentioned because if uh, you are not a parent or guardian you are not allowed to spank the child and I will add usually it's only biological parents who are allowed to do that if you are a guardian meaning uh, uh, let's say an aunt or an uncle that can be or uh, someone outside of the family that even more so that can be seen as problematic so how do we distinguish between physical abuse and an accident we talked about corporal punishment next we're going to talk about what constitutes physical abuse and what is more of an accident to distinguish between the two it requires us to observe the location of the injury accidents are more likely to happen on things like knees elbows shins and forehead whereas protected body parts and soft tissue areas are less likely to be accidentally injured back thighs genital area buttocks back of legs face not that a person uh, is in, incapable of, get, of uh, falling or having an accident and getting a mark on their back thighs genital area buttocks back of legs face but it is less likely than on those areas that frequently come into contact with the ground knees elbow shins forehead or with things like you know the door or a variety of other things that could happen uh, in terms of accidents we want to be assessing the number and frequency of injuries here if a person just has one injury or that doesn't occur again um, that's different than someone who has a series of injuries over a prolonged period of time assuming that that person is not horrendously accident prone it is unlikely that they will have that extent of injury over that period of time we also want to be assessing the size and the shape of the injury because if we look for patterns for example we talked about an, a hot iron mark or we talked about um, a belt buckle mark for example those kinds of injuries are unlikely to happen by accident we also want to be looking at a description of how the injury occurred sometimes the child or the caregiver will provide a description of the injury that, that does, does not match it doesn't seem feasible or possible for example falling from a chair would not result in injuries all over the body a toddler trying to run 
is likely to have scraped knees possibly and less likely to break their arm than compared with an eight-year-old who has learned to climb trees so we want to be aware of context here developmental process developmental stage in addition to knowing uh, what kinds of falls constitute what kinds of injuries we also know that a two-week-old does not have the capacity to inflict a bruise meaning for uh, newborns with newborns have bruising uh, typically that is not an accident of their own doing now it may just be a, an accident that the caregiver regrets that it does not con constitute physical abuse but it is something to be aware of and attentive to remember that injuries happen of course it is recurrent injuries or injuries to less common body areas that are cause for concern. So we talked about the difference between abuse and accident, physical abuse and accident. Next let's look at a type of neglect that is somewhat murky, which is unsupervised or known as latchkey children. These are children who, for example, will return home after school and the parent is still working. So you may have a 10, 11, 12 year old, for example, coming home after school to an empty house. The appropriateness of this varies on a case by case basis. Some 10 year olds are able to care for themselves after school until their parents return home, for example, whereas some middle aged persons with disabilities require 24 hour supervision at all times, known as total care. So this is going to vary. I will say though that if a child is under the age of 10 and they are left unsupervised for long periods of time, say the parents leave the country for a business trip and the child is left unsupervised, that constitutes neglect automatically because that's child abandonment. Um, however, if a child is 13, say, and the parent is, uh, is summer vacation, for example, it's summer break from school and the parent is working, Typically that is okay if the child is able to care for themselves. We do want a little more supervision than that in most cases, but it is not unheard of for a teenager to be at home alone during the day during the summer break. Note that children may be able to care for themselves, but may not be able to care for younger children. So in the case of a 13 year old, it may, may be appropriate for them to be at home playing video games or whatever over the summer while their parents are at work but it may be inappropriate for them to be caring for their five-year-old sister during that point in time. Parents must be accessible a phone call away and ready to leave and come home as needed in cases like that. Parents should not be out of the country. They should not be unable to quickly return home in the case of an accident or an emergency. Let's look at medical neglect and failure to obtain medical care. This is difficult to substantiate and must be considered in light of available resources. So for example, if a person lives in a rural area and there are not medical uh, services easily provided to them, financial ability to pay for treatment, culture and religious beliefs about things like Western medicine, consequences of failure to obtain medical care, and for example, for example, there may be a very minimal consequence for failing to obtain medical care. Let's say the child needs a wellness appointment checkup and there's not a horrendous uh, aftershock from not attending that appointment. Whereas if a child has a substantial medical issue, something like diabetes, um, it could be something else like they have um, perhaps cancer during childhood and they are not uh, cared for that adequately that is different and the caregivers understanding of medical necessity you cannot uh, say that a parent is being neglectful if they don't understand the risks involved if they don't understand what what they ha may happen to their child education therefore is important for parents so they understand exactly what their child or their adult in under their care is going through and so they're able to better to take care of them and, and help them with their medical issues. Some situations outside the scope of reporting include educational neglect known as truancy. This is not something you would call CPS or APS about. 
is usually handled by schools. Lack of immunizations and preventative care. This is a controversial issue because parents will not vaccinate their children for a variety of reasons. This does not constitute medical neglect in most states currently at this time of, of doing this video lecture. Failure to use seat belts as restraints. This is a legal issue. A parent can get into major legal problems with not doing that with children, but it does not constitute neglect. And non-adult caregiver sexual abuse. This includes child-on-child -child sexual abuse. So if you have, for example, a child in the home who is being abused by another child in the home, and the child is below the age of 16, the parent or and and the child cannot be for the child perpetrating that cannot be uh, uh, charged with physical abuse, sexual abuse, those issues, with one exception. If it is very apparent that there is a supervision issue going on, meaning the parent needs to be around more, the parent is absent, and that is why this abuse is occurring. If there is a easy way or, a, or a, if it is readily apparent that the parent is not supervising appropriately, then the parent can be found uh, to be the perpetrator of neglect because they are not supervising appropriately and that's why this um, abuse is occurring between siblings or children. Locality issues. This is also fairly frequent to come up. I, I just had mentioned child-on-child -child sexual abuse. That can come up as well fairly frequently. This is another issue that may come up in your future clinical work. You should still report cases of abuse or neglect for the following scenario. The caregiver is outside of state lines, so in another state, and the child reports a history of being abused or neglected by them. In such a case, you would report the abuse or neglect to that caregiver's jurisdiction where they are currently residing. The rationale here is that by doing so, there will be a CPS or APS agency that will follow up and that the caregiver may still be abusing or neglecting others. Even if they don't have regular contact with that child or adult, we still want to be reporting that because that person may be um, perpetrating more abuse or neglect towards others. So even when a person is several states away, we still want to be calling up that state, that locality in which they reside and making that report. You should still report cases of abuse or neglect for the following scenario. We're going to talk about issues of history now. If a child reports history of abuse or neglect by a caregiver from several years back, it may even be 10 years back, because remember, with things like sexual abuse, a person does not feel ready to talk about that right away. And young children, of course, may not even understand what's going on fully. Even if it was a one-time event and is not ongoing, that still needs to be reported. Unless it is severe sexual abuse, for example, it is unlikely that CPS or APS are going to intervene strongly. That doesn't mean that your uh, obligations as a mandated reporter, which we'll talk about in a moment, are any less. You still have to report that, but just know that, and you can tell this to the client, that uh, because this is in the way back past, it's kind of unlikely that CPS or APS is going to do a lot about that. So nevertheless, it's important for the report to be made. Why you should report? First, it is required by law. Counselors, as well as other health professionals, are mandated reporters, meaning you are required by law to report all cases of abuse or neglect that are told to you or that you suspect. The purpose of this is to pr protect vulnerable populations, both your client and future persons who are at risk from coming into contact with the potential perpetrator, the alleged perpetrator. Remember that CPS or APS cannot act until a report is made. So even if um, there may be some local knowledge by CPS or APS about uh, there may be something going on in this family, 
maybe the family has come into contact with CPS or APS before in the past, they cannot act until a report is made. So your reporting is very important for the case to be moved forward. The following persons must report. The following are mandated reporters. Health providers, school employees, social workers, law enforcement, child care agencies, court mediators and advocates, athletic coaches. All persons who have supervisory responsibilities of children and adults. When you should report. Whenever you believe a vulnerable person has been abused or neglected. You always make a report when a child or adult tells you they have been abused or neglected. You do not question that. You make the report. Even if you doubt the veracity of that, and you will have ch children, usually children, who will report abuse or neglect based on family conflict and wanting to get back at an adult uh, for an issue that they have. And typically that's usually an indication of more psychological abuse than it is uh, uh, physical or sexual abuse, if there's no history of that and, and you really don't think that's going on, there still can be abuse involved is what I'm trying to say. It may also be the case that the person is being absolutely truthful and they just haven't disclosed it before. And that's the reason why you would always make the report because really it's not your business to assess that. Always make a report if you have seen potential signs of abuse or neglect. This is where you can help with assessment. Um, your job is to help in cases where the child or the adult seems to have some signs of being abused or neglected but is not coming forward about that. And so your job is to assess for any of those signs and to report on that rather than to assess the veracity of a patient or client's report um, of a verbal report of abuse or neglect. The timeline for reporting in what the state of Washington, and this does vary state by state, so I'm just telling you in terms of Washington, is within 48 hours. Outside of that, you can be uh, found liable for breaching your responsibilities as a mandated reporter. So just remember, you don't have a long window of time. You must report within 48 hours. And remember, you must report if the victim is under 18 years of age even if the incident is historical. So, what if you're unsure? What if you just have a case and it's kind of gray and murky? It just, I don't know, you're just not sure about what to report or not. And this will happen in clinical practice. I can tell you it happens more often than I thought it would, which is you have cases that are kind of, I don't know, on the borderline. They're just it's hard to know if it really is abuse or neglect or if it's not or if it meets the criteria. In those cases I recommend the following. Contacting CPS and APS and asking the following in a broad, general, non-specific manner. I have a hypothetical case that I want your opinion about. Let's say I have a child or adult client who has reported that blank, you would fill in the blank there, or let's say I've, I have observed that a child or adult has whatever it is that you've observed. Would you consider this to be reportable to your agency as abuse or neglect? So you're not giving client specific information, but you are describing a situation and asking if that qualifies. If the person says yes, then you give them the full report. If the CPS or APS worker says no, then you document that you called and that you what you would call consulted with them and determined that it was not reportable. Either way, you have met your obligations as a mandated reporter. How you should report. There are two different um, avenues of doing this. Daytime hours are best if you can do that because you can make a direct report to the local CPS APS APS agency for the county the abuse or neglect occurred in and that results in faster response times usually. You can also report after hours. There is a child abuse and neglect hotline for example 1-866-END-HARM or 
4276, which is Washington State's 24-7 hour hotline. There's also a national hotline that is further than Washington State, which is 1-800-562-5624, and you would use that number after hours if you need to report an incident of abuse or neglect that happened in a certain locality, let's say a certain county, in another state. I do recommend daytime reporting though if you can and it, you may well have to look up that information on Google to find the specific phone number to the local county agency that you're going to be reporting that to if it's out of state. Or even if it's within state you still need to do that digging to find that phone number. The kind of information that you will provide during that phone call includes when the abuse or neglect was reported or identified there's a date or a time here that you need to be documenting before you make that phone call. The name, address, phone number of the victim, caregivers, per perpetrators. So you need all that information up front, as much as you know. Birth date, age, sex, race of victim and caregivers. Names and ages of persons who live with the victim and their relationship. This may well be siblings. It could be um, just other people who live in a group home, for example, or, um, or you could, if you know the person lives in a nursing home, you would articulate that. Nature and extent of abuse or neglect, including any information about prior maltreatment to siblings or others in the household, if you know that. Any special language needs, for example, if they don't, if the either the victim or the perpetrator does not speak English as a first language. Or they have uh, they they sign for example they have sign language they do not uh, uh, speak English as you know a verbal English. Any child or adult developmental or disability issues. History of mental disorders or substance use. Family resources and strengths. You want to be talking about strengths as well. Caretakers' response to interventions. Socioeconomic status and your phone name, address, and phone number. The caretaker's response to interventions is important because if a caretaker is unresponsive and it is a neglect issue, that is very important to know about. Whereas if there is an incident of, let's say, physical abuse that's occurred and the caregiver wants to change and has been working with you on anger management, then that gives the agency uh, more information with which to work from because they may, for example, decide to go, instead of the legal route, uh, charging them with an offense, more of the family intervention route of assisting that person, giving them more resources. The interview. Before making that phone call, typically you're going to want to sit down with the person who has been identified as the survivor, the victim, and ask them some questions so you get a better sense of what is exactly happened. At the very beginning of that interview, before I read through any of the rest of the slide, you probably need to be disclosing your role. So mentioning, for example, either you have uh, reported to me this, um, and I have to let you know that I am legally reported to uh, uh, tell authorities about this, um, that's part of my role here so that your family or uh, your agency or uh, your group home or wherever, whoever you are working with can receive the services that they need to, to help you fully in your situation. And I'm going to need to ask you some questions to understand more about what's going on exactly so that I can pass that information along. It's a, that's part of the reason why during intakes you want to mention abuse or neglect reporting as an important limit to confidentiality. It will shut a person down very quickly if they did not expect you to tell them, you know, I have to report this when they've told you some information. They should know ahead of time that, okay, if they report this to you, that you are a mandated reporter. So during your intakes, you should be talking about that. So let's assume that you've talked through your role the next thing to do is to find a quiet private space without distractions or interruptions because it's not easy stuff to talk about and you want to make sure that the person feels that they have privacy and that they don't have people coming and going because that will make them feel more anxious. <laughs> 
You want to sit in close proximity to a person, not behind a desk. Obviously not too close, you don't want to make the person feel claustrophobic and crowded, but you do want to be fairly informal. It doesn't work to be approaching this from behind a desk. You want to be sitting uh, so that you are in an open pasture, uh, at least fairly close by, to show interest and support. Reassure that person they are not in trouble. Both children and adult clients who have disabilities or dementia will believe that they're in trouble, that they have done something wrong, and providing that reassurance early on is important. It will help to relieve some of their anxiety. Ask permission before touching the person, if indicated. For example, if a person has an apparent bruise or a person has a scrape and there's a need to touch them for whatever reason, Touching bruising may hurt or the child may have an emotional response to touch, so you always want to be asking before you do so. Ask open-ended questions. Mention that we need to talk to someone who can help us in situations like this. That was the preamble that I had referenced earlier on. Avoid pressing for details if the person is uncomfortable. This is important because your role here is not to substantiate abuse or neglect, not to prove that. It's just to gather information that you can pass along. Avoid making false promises. For example, I promise I won't tell anyone. Avoid asking leading questions. For example, when did they molest you if a person has not disclosed that they were molested? And avoid berating the perpetrator. This one is especially tough and tricky because you will feel a pull to do that when you, the person who has been abused or neglected will share what has happened to them. But also remember that the survivor will have mixed feelings. They often will like or even love the perpetrator. And so you disclosing your anger or uh, disclosing... Um, how much of a dislikable person the perpetrator is, is not going to be helpful and in fact may make the, the survivor more upset, the interviewee. So you must report, you know you are a mandated reporter. Uh, it's important for me to go over with you what the liabilities and penalties are for not reporting, mostly because I don't want any of you to be in this situation. In terms of liability, you are protected from being sued for making a report so long as you document the phone call and it cannot be proven you acted with malicious intent or intentionally made a false report. The burden of proof is on the other person, not you. So there is some protection against being sued for doing this. If you do not report, there is a penalty and it's going to vary state by state in the state of Washington it is a gross misdemeanor charge, so you will receive a, a criminal record for not reporting this. Note that you do not have to report abuse or neglect if the incident has already been reported to Child Protective Services, Adult Protective Services. If it is already reported, be sure to document who told you this information, when it was received, etc. And it may be worth, in some cases, calling up CPS or APS and asking, was this reported to you? Because you really need to be verifying that. A person may well say that it's been reported in the past when it has not been. Some barriers to reporting. These are barriers for you as the therapist. It's important for you to process, to think through, to self-reflect on your own emotions that are evoked by some of the following issues, and these are just a few of the issues that can come up for you that can influence your responding in that moment. First is corporal punishment. How do you feel about that? Second is latchkey children. How do you feel about that? Medical necessity. Taking away parental rights. Children being interviewed without parents present. We'll discover in a moment that parents do not have to be present when a child is interviewed by uh, you or by a CPS APS worker. Separating siblings in foster homes. The social services system. Many of us have a bias against that system, which may um, influence our 
willingness to report. Informing caregivers is not a requirement. It is a requirement to report, but you do have the choice of whether to tell caregivers or not. So parents, guardians, people who work in a nursing home. There are pros and cons to this. There's never a right answer in terms of do you tell the parent or the guardian, the caretake, caretaker, caregiver this. If you do so, the pro is, is that it can be important to maintain trust and rapport because you're not doing something behind their back that they find out later um, that's, that has happened and they will usually be able to trace back from their own while, their own guile, sorry, uh, who has made that report. The con is you do not disclose if it puts the dependent person at risk, meaning if there's a situation of physical abuse or sexual abuse or the person is in danger, the, the survivor is in danger, you do not tell the caregiver. You imagine, for example, a parent who becomes very angry at finding out their parent, their child has, uh, or their uh, uh, the adult, uh, vulnerable adult, has reported abuse or neglect and responds by um, punishing the child or the vulnerable adult for doing so. If you are unsure, you can always discuss this with at the CPS or APS worker during the phone call in terms of do I inform the caregiver or not, so you can always consult. If you are disclosing to the caregiver, if you decide to do that, be honest. Mention your role as a mandated reporter. Mention that it is not your role to prove whether a verbal report or marks or bruises constitute abuse or neglect. That's the role for somebody else, and it's just your role to report that. You must still report marks that may have been caused by accidental means. It's not your role, really, to assess whether or not those were accidental or not. Most of the time, reports lead to help services rather than children or dependents being taken away via the foster care system, for example. Parents will fear that their child is going to be taken away, which may happen depending on severity, but most of the time services are provided instead. In terms of confidentiality, your privacy is not guaranteed as a reporter. You should know this. Um, uh, not that you should already know this, but you, it is important for you to know this. Your identity may be revealed in a court of law if CPS or APS records are under subpoena so people can find out who made that report and what was said. So just tell the basic facts, everything you observe. Do not give your clinical opinion. That is for the CPS or APS worker to decide. In terms of typical CPS or APS responses, there are a variety of these. One is the family assessment response that includes services to the family. The second is the investigation response, which is usually more of a legal matter, um, basically assessing whether or not a person can be charged of a crime. The alleged perpetrator has the right to appeal the investigation findings in that case. And if there is a decision to remove the, ho the child from the home and into a foster care placement or group home placement. There is the allowance or provision for the person, the child, the survivor, the adult to be placed in a 72 hour shelter care hold, um, which is based on business days. So if they're placed there on a Saturday, then their, uh, their 72 hours would begin actually on a Monday, unless that was a holiday. But the, uh, the, Social services is allowed to um, take away the child or the vulnerable adult that is the presumed to be the survivor of abuse or neglect for a 72 hour period while an assessment is made about uh, whether or not the abuse or neglect occurred and what to do about that. The family assessment response is the least severe and in many ways one of the most helpful responses. Um, it is not used, I will say, in cases where there is severe abuse or neglect. It is used more when there is an issue that can be worked through, remediated. The focus is on assessing 
whether services are needed rather than whether abuse or neglect occurred. So there's already an assumption that uh, perhaps abuse or neglect occurred, uh, but really we don't need to be um, moving forward with um, uh, um, basically charging a person with an offense. Instead, we need to be providing services to try to help this family. So again, indicated if there's no immediate threat to safety or well-being, it's not severe. Examples would include lack of supervision, physical neglect, minor physical injury, emotional abuse or neglect. This can take about 45 to 60 days for the assessment before services are provided. In the family assessment response, the types of services that may be provided based on the assessment include individual counseling, family counseling, parenting groups or classes, respite daycare, family supervision or home visits, and a safety plan that's generated with the caregiver and the CPS APS worker. In the family assessment response, for uh, uh, if there are placements made outside the home, every effort is made beforehand to maintain the child in the home if appropriate. So in other words, we don't necessarily remove the child from the home unless at all we can help it. If safety can be maintained, the CPS worker creates what we just talked about, a safety contract with the caretakers. If it cannot be maintained, there are a series of steps that are followed before a child is taken into emergency custody. First, the alleged perpetrator is first asked to leave the home. Second, if not possible, the child is placed with a relative if available. Third, if not possible, the child is then placed in a foster home or group home. And if emergent, the child can be taken into emergency custody for a specific limited period of time. So we try to uh, reduce the uh, potential for the child to be taken away from the home if at all possible. The investigation response includes this is when there's a more of a legal approach, legal charge that's going to be uh, assessed, whether or not the person is going to be uh, charged with a legal offense. There's a focus on assessing whether abuse or neglect occurred. It is indicated if there is an immediate threat to safety or well-being, if there are previous reports of abuse or neglect, or an investigation is required by law. For example, there has been the death of a victim. Examples of investigation responses include sexual abuse, child death, serious physical injuries, injuries requiring medical evaluation or treatment, hospitalization due to suspected abuse or neglect, abandonment, and abuse or neglect occurring in non-family homes, so foster care, daycare, schools. If there is a report of that occurring, then there's not going to be the family assessment response, there's going to be an investigation response. So in cases of adult abuse and neglect, most typically unless they're living in a home, a family home, uh, which is un atypical, most of the time in those cases they are living in a facility, there is going to be an investigation response. The investigation response can take 45 to 60 days Typically, the police officer may accompany the CPS or APS worker to this, to the investigation response. The CPS worker will interview the person who made the report and the victim, even without the caretaker present. The parents are usually notified afterward. Photographs or x-rays may be ordered without the caretaker's permission. An example of this might be the CPS worker and the uh, police officer may well come to the school where the child is without the parent knowing and interview the child. The report is either founded, there is evidence, or unfounded, no evidence. So they're looking for evidence to verify uh, the reporting, the earlier reporting. So your role is as a mandated reporter and you can request feedback from CPS APS about the status of the case that you reported on. Note that CPS or APS independently may not contact you afterward, so they may not follow up with you and may not divulge further information unless necessary with you. You, you can still ask them 
but just know that they will not necessarily be contacting you. You may have to contact them if you want to follow up. What if the report is not accepted? Some reports are not actionable by CPS and APS, which can be highly frustrating if you are the clinician, especially if you really suspect something is going on that is harming your client. This should not result in you failing to make future reports to CPS or APS. In fact, if they, the report that you make is unfounded or is not actionable um, and you're still concerned something is going on, you continue to assess, you may make further reports until something occurs. Some action occurs on the part of CPS or APS. The issue of cultural competence is an important one to be aware of when you are making reports to CPS and APS. CPS and APS in Washington is trying to address race and ethnic disproportionality, meaning greater disproportionalities are found between different racial ethnic groups with initial referrals. So there are, for example, a higher percentage of persons who are non-white, who are minority status, who are initially referred to abuse or neglect uh, who, uh, uh, as as being per uh, perpetuants or um, or uh, perpetrators of sorry child abuse or neglect, decisions to remove the child from the home are disproportionate in that a greater percentage of minority non Caucasian uh, 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 victims or survivors are removed from the home. When a child is in state custody for longer than two years, there is disproportionality because there are more minority children uh, who are in state custody for longer than two years. And poverty is hypothesized to be a mediating factor in all of this, although it's again hypothesized. The fact is, um, for whatever reason, that minority children are at greater risk of being um, uh, survivors of abuse or neglect being both being a uh, report being made about that uh, both being removed from the home and finally being in state custody longer than two years this has resulted in efforts to recognize the importance of natural cultural community and family ties because of the importance of a more co a collectivist um, family system in a lot of um, non-Caucasian minority groups, Latino, Latina, Hispanic groups, for example. Uh, cultural family ties are very important, same for African American groups, same for um, uh, j just a variety, Asian American groups, same uh, just a variety of non-Caucasian groups. In addition to this, we want to identify tribal affiliation for Native Americans who are involved in abuse or neglect reporting because if they are on a reservation decisions are made by the child's tribe that the tribe has jurisdiction rather than uh, CPS APS and that's important to be aware of. So in Washington State we do want to focus on cultural competence and understanding whether or not something is indeed abuse or neglect or not. When it comes to something like corporal punishment, for example, maybe there are different cultural norms to that. That doesn't make it right, but we want to be wondering about that and wondering about our own cultural experience of abuse and neglect compared to others. So last slide, there are some resources available to you uh, and to families when you are working with cases of child abuse and neglect and adult abuse and neglect. Most of these resources, however, are going to be for child abuse and neglect. The first is there is a medical consultant network which is operated by the University of Washington. This is for mostly physicians, but I think mental health counselors could probably call and ask for support if they needed to consult. So if a physician has seen something, for example, and they're not sure if it constitutes abuse or neglect, they could call this consultant network. Child protection teams. Every community in Washington state has, team, has a team that staff cases, review issues, and assist in treatment planning. 
family team decision making decides where the child should live. This is comprised of social workers and families. This is when the child is in the foster care system typically, although it can also operate when the child is being considered for a residential placement. And families and youth in conflict. This is when families may request family reconciliation services, also known as um, uh, foster care prevention services which serves to protect, strengthen, and preserve families rather than split up the family. Again, a form of foster care prevention, which is free of, uh, of charge, completely free, voluntary, and family focused. So if there is a family who is in crisis or is at risk of abuse or neglect, um, this can be a very useful resource, family and youth in conflict. It's a program run in the state of Washington. So that concludes our video lecture on abuse and neglect reporting and it's been a long lecture so I hope that you've been able to sit in there with me and get through this and that it will be helpful to you in your future work and please bring questions to class if you have some and I look forward to hearing about those. This concludes the video lecture on abuse and neglect reporting.